Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Farming Podcast brought to you by Private Property. My name is Mbali Nwoko, your host. Every Tuesdays and Thursdays, as always, right here on our YouTube channel, Facebook, live on Instagram, you name it. I hope that you have been subscribing to our YouTube channel and really getting some information around farming as we've had an array of different guests in different industries um, or subsectors within the farming industry uh, doing amazing things. And I think if you're looking to go into farming, I truly, truly believe that this podcast is for you. For any regulars watching the show, thank you so much for your continuous support. Um, we have great competitions uh, that we're running right now with the private property team, the farming podcast team, uh, sp specifically the Echo Buzz competition. So go to our social media pages and have a look around that because it involves the home growers gardening series edition that we do within the private property once a month. I also hope that you've been enjoying the gardening series. Uh, I can definitely say I love being outdoors and obviously getting to chat with Cass. Um, I think he's such a great and fantastic individual and his whole philosophy around growing your own food, producing your own food, more so in your backyard garden. Today we have an interesting topic called uh, fermentation and modern farming. And we're joined by Pierre Cronier, who's the manager of Leafy's Farmery. And we're gonna learn about uh, his operation. I believe he's an aquaponics farmer um, and Leafy's Farmery is an aquaponics farm with a bit of fermentation involved. So um, if you have any question and if this topic interests you please comment like share engage we definitely want to hear your thoughts as well over and above the questions that i'll be asking pierre and i hope that uh, you know we could give you some sufficient information around the specific topic well let's get in straight into the show pierre how are you doing and thank you so much for joining us thank you very much i'm doing very well thank you Awesome, awesome. So um, you have quite a unique business. I mean, uh, uh, we're talking just behind the scenes to say that you are kindly doing aquaponics and a bit of fermentation, if I'm correct with that. So just maybe give us a brief background on who you are and uh, what is Leafy's Farmery all about? Yes, uh, Leafy's Farmery um, got the two legs, as you mentioned, the growery and the fermentary. The growery is an aquaponics farm um, where we grew, uh, grow leafy greens uh, in a deep water culture system with the assistance of fish to provide you nutrients uh, for, for that uh, leafy greens. And then on the side, we have also a small fermentary where we ferment milk into kombucha, um, kefir and then also tea into kombucha. Um, but it's a very small operation and both uh, the um, growery and the fermentary is I, like I would suppose it's a niche, niche farm. Yeah, yeah. Pierre, did you grow up in a farm? Are you an urban uh, gentleman? How do you get into the space? <laughs> no, no, I'm not, a, I'm not a grower on a farm. Um, I'm very much a city person. 
Um, but the technology and the benefits of the environment of um, aquaponics um, is very interesting and that, that piqued my interest and that's how we started it, um, to get more involved in this new technology and new urban practices. Mm. So other than just technology and having an interest, what really pulled you in within aquaponics farming? I mean, why didn't you go find a farm somewhere and start farming the conventional way? Um, why did you specifically choose aquaponics? Um, because of its small footprint. Mm -hmm. Because um, you're not in the soil, so you don't have any weed problems. So it's a clean um, production method. Um, it allows me to do some other um, work in between. So there's a, a minimal care that you need to do it. You need to do it daily. So you're quite involved. You, you just can't leave it. But it allows you to do other work for other income streams. And then on harvest days and plant days, obviously, you're more involved. And there's certain peak times like uh, where you need to spray the plants or need to clean the filters. But it's not that involved. And you don't need a lot of planting tractors and equipment for that. It's only this equipment. So that made it possible for me to, to do this type of farming. Yeah, I think it's definitely quite a lucrative strategy. I mean, if we look at the input costs right now, fertilizers have gone up by 60%. Uh, getting machinery such as tractors are also quite expensive. So it's quite a steep investment that one would have to make when they're going to yeah. into, into you know, normal uh, conventional farming. So going back to aquaponics, so what type of fish are you currently dealing with? And you also mentioned leafy greens. Specifically, what type of leafy greens are you growing? Yes, so we, the, my fishing strategy is working around the temperatures or the, or the climate of the year. So in the winter months, at the moment, I've got in rainbow trout. So that's uh, cold water fish. So we, we, we um, in, put them into the holding tanks during the winter. It's getting a bit warm for them now, so we're about to harvest them. And mm -hmm. then for the summer months, we're going to use tilapia, so, mm -hmm. um, which is a warm water fish. So mm -hmm. that's the strategy on the, on the fish side. Mm -hmm. And then on the greens, we are growing fancy lettuces. Um, spring onions are also surprisingly doing very well. And then also we had kale in there that's also doing very well. Mm -hmm. And we also want to go forward and do other herbs. I like um, basil, for instance, want to bring in there as well. And that's mm -hmm. what we're growing in the, in what we call the deep water culture. So it's a channel about 300 millimeters deep. So it's a deep water culture channel where the leafies are green are growing on raw mm, mm. and can can one start with aquaponics just starting with any type of fish or are there specific type of fish that will do well or grow well in a specific climate or area um for the you can use any type of fish so people yeah. that's doing it as a hobby can use koi fish gold fish anything as a commercial farmer, I want a commercial product. And that's why I'm using um, rainbow trout and tilapia then, uh, because they are fairly fast growing. And then mm -hmm. there's a market for them to sell on into restaurants or to people, uh, because you can eat them. Uh, while the koi fish is only ornamental. Mm -hmm. You know, in my style of farming, we talk about if you're scaling, you must maybe have 20 to 30 to 40 greenhouse tunnels for a grain farmer, if you're talking about scaling, it's all about thousands of hectares. How does one scale as an aquaponic farmer? You know, I've seen some aquaponic structures, mostly it's just like tubs. Um, if I could put it that way, I don't know if that's the right terminology. So uh, because your strategy is growing commercially, so like what is commercial scale in your aspect, in your industry? Is it the number of fish that you have, the size of the tubs? Just maybe give us some insights there. Yes. Um, I'm using an aquaponic system that's provided by Aztec Agri. And they provide a commercial system. A commercial system it's, uh, is consists in one tunnel, about 10 meters by 30 meters. That's a space okay. needed. And there's three lines. Now, and each line got two holding tanks of 3,000 liter each, and then a filter system uh, of 2,000 liters, more or less, and then a deep water culture channel and a media bed. So that's mm -hmm. one, one channel. So it provides about 2,200 planting opportunities per, per channel. So you have 6,000, almost seven, in total with the media bed, you've got 7,200 plant, it's called opportunities of plants that you can put in there. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and you can harvest about um, 1,200 uh, plant, say, letters of head per week can you harvest off the system once it's fully operational. So my, it depends obviously on your operational costs and mm -hmm. your overheads, but you can make it work with one commercial system, but mm -hmm. you probably need two to be, um, to be profitable and earn an income from it and to cover all your operational costs and overhead costs. With, with yeah. the system. So that's a scale you would be looking at. And obviously, as soon as you get more than that, then obviously it's getting better and better down the line. Right. And as a startup investment, you mentioned a 10 by 30 tunnel, 1,200 lettuce heads. Um, going back to the fish as well, how many fish does one need to start off with? Is it buying hundreds or maybe say, um, how many fish could fit in that 10 by 30 structure as well? Yes. So it depends on the type of fish. Tilapia, you can put in a bit more and, and, and rainbow trout a little bit less. So it's a fine balance in the system. Um, you need to balance all the factors. If you're putting too much fish, your system may crash. So mm -hmm. at the moment, I've got 150 um, tilapia per 3,000 tank. And mm -hmm. then with, uh, um, with the rainbow trout and with the tilapia, you can almost double that. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what we put in the tanks. Uh, that's to ensure that there's not too much solids in the system because it's an, it's an anaerobic, um, aerobic system. And then if you create too much solids, you get anaerobic zones, which may throw out your chemicals and your balances in the system. And then you could be crashing. So that you definitely don't want. Right. You know, as part of our topic this evening, it's also about modern farming, right? You're definitely coming with a different strategy, with a different system and different setup in which you're running your aquapod, uh, aqu aquaponics um, structure. So tell me, going back to still, or sticking still to the, to the topic around modern farming, how reliant is the specific system that you're referring to on electricity? Can one be reliant on electricity or can you build such a system off grid? And would it make return on investment in terms of the, the capital outlay? This is totally reliant on electricity. Wow. But where I'm farming at the moment, there's no electricity there, so we're using solar. Mm. So electricity would be not one of your major cost items. Your fish feed is your biggest cost item in terms of operational expenditure. Mm. Um, the system we're using use very little electri electricity. To run one of those lines is using um, in the normal run of the mill, not when all the other pumps and other filters are coming on, is using the same... Uh, watts or the same energy as a, as a large um, bulb. Mm -hmm. So it's about uh, it's running on, on about 200 watts. Mm -hmm. So the electricity is not the problem. So we're using it, running it off solar. Um, mm -hmm. But even if you do have ESCOM, you will have to have a backup system in terms of a battery because mm -hmm. during load shedding, you can't switch off the system. The system must be continuously circulating to ensure that the, the nutrients get to the plants and to ensure the oxygen is getting to the fish. So it's a 24, seven day a week, every day of the year operation. You can't just switch it off and go away. <laughs> wow, it sounds definitely much more intensive than what I'm used to. At least I can get a break during the weekends. So I really, really do not wish I was in your position. But in terms of labor um, as well, how many, how many staff would one have to get running um, to, to manage such an operation? It's not a huge labor intensive to run the system. Your okay. labor is coming in when you harvest. Then it's as per normal with any operation. Once you take off the lettuce, it needs to be all the greens. You need to package them and you need to transform them. So that's, that's the normal like everybody knows. Yes. Um, the labor to run the system, you need for one tunnel with three lines. You can get away with two people, one, two, maybe three people. Uh, mm -hmm. as, soon, as long as you get your operations nice in a row and you get your, in the sequence of the correct, the, the activities that's going in there is just going through all your plants to look for diseases and take mm -hmm. out the ones that are failing, making sure it's clean. You need to keep that tunnel exceptionally clean. So it's a whole day cleaning. Then yeah. it's also um, spraying with bio um, or chemical, not chemicals. You can't spray with chemicals that will kill the fish. So we use um, agricultural soaps or certain oils 
that we spray very careful not to affect the fish. So you need to do a preventative. You can't come in when there's too many pests in there because then, then you've got a problem. So you need to do preventative. So that's an ongoing thing. Feeding of the fish as well. You want to get maximum growth. So you will feed at intervals, looking at the size of the fish. So you don't overfeed because then you get solids in the system again. Um, and then we also got a different filters and systems that actually take the solids, break them down, put them back for nutrients. So that's basically what, what the person would be doing to, to do on the upkeep of the system. And then yeah. obviously the harvest, you've got your harvest days, then there's a lot of, then you need more people taking <laughs> off all the produce and package them and so forth. But yeah, so the day-to-day -day stuff, two to three people per tunnel will be more than enough. Right. Is it true that with aquaponics, like you have the, the, the fish at the bottom, the, the vegetables at the top, um, is it true that your vegetable growing um, uh, practices is heavily reliant on the feed that the fish provide? So are you not adding any additional fertilizers to, you know, to get that lettuce going? Is, it, is the lettuce completely uh, grown by the, the extracts from, from, from the water, which is uh, as a result of the fish? Well, it's a sort of a, a science, yes, to, to grow it. So you've got uh, that nitrification cycle from the fish, um, which, which produce ammonia, which is converted to um, nitrates and so forth to provide nutrients for the fish. But um, micronutrients and nutrients are, are, are a lot of the times lacking in a system like this. So what, and also you need to carefully watch your pH of the water. So mm -hmm. what I'm doing is I'm using certain chemicals to lower, normally, normally the pH are lowered by the aerobic system. So I'm using chemicals to raise it, to get it at a specific level, but the same chemical, we're like using hydroxides. So the same chemical, once it's breaking down and doing its pH work, um, it's also then providing um, nutrients to the or micronutrients to the plant in, in the form of, of um, potassium and calcium. Also, so systems like this is typically iron deficient. So we also add a little bit of iron. And then occasionally, maybe, maybe if I want to, if I see maybe there's some, um, the plants are not reacting as well, I may add some kelp or um, fish emulsion, but in, in the little quali quantities, you don't want to add too much. Mm. Um, and then also carefully watch how much fish feed you are providing because also, fish feed that's not taken up or not eaten by the fish that's also getting broken down and provide nutrients so you there's a fine it's almost the art so you need to have a fine balance using the technology and the science but also there's some feeling and art to to the whole thing yeah and i i get the sense that you also have to definitely be hands-on you know just, yes. to, just to see how the operations go and to speak up pick up any mistakes or minor issues that may potentially arise. Um, so how do you then come with, it seems like you've got a, a very solid base going, but where does the fermentation part of the business come in? And uh, uh, I heard you say tea. So, so far we've been talking about fish and lettuce. So how does tea and milk, up, I suppose, come into the space? Yes. <laughs> um, it's a whole thing to do of doing good for the earth um, and doing good to others. Yeah. And then fermentary products are very good for one's health. So we're using it ourselves. So um, we um, are lucky to have very, in, in the immediate vicinity, very good uh, dairy farmers where we get fresh milk from. And then it, so we, you, we pr promote that uh, for the goodness of the earth, but also to get the name out, of the, out there. So we provide these uh, fermentary products to health shops. So it's just to get a bigger awareness of our name, Leafy's Farmery to the mm -hmm. people out there and to do the good. And that's, that's why we are doing it. Also to supplement income where we can and how we can. So both of the kombucha and uh, um, Kiefa is got very good uh, profit margins on them. Although the markets are very small, but it's something nice to keep us going, provide a small cash flow, and mm -hmm. make us name known a bit wider than, than we would have if we had only have uh, greenery. Yeah, could you please explain to the private property what kombucha is? It's the first time I hear that term. Yes, kombucha is, uh, is basically fermented tea. So oh. you use black tea or green tea uh, with a little bit of sugar and you place it with what I call the scoby. So it's a, 
it's a, it's a symbiotic combination of bacteria and yeast um, that eats the sugar and the caffeine from the tea. Um, and then making it, if you leave it long enough, you actually get uh, like vinegar. So it's changing it into something sli slightly sourly sweet mm -hmm. with a unique, unique taste. And yeah, and that's what you get. Right. This is such a fantastic eye opener. I mean, uh, who knew that we could, you know, ferment tea? I, I, I had no idea. And obviously turn it into such products and how tea could eventually transform into vinegar. So I'm definitely learning something new. But I think to sum up our conversation, Pierre, um, what's your take on modern farming? It sounds like you are not only just farming for a commercial perspective, but you're actually farming to change the environment around you. And maybe just also to change your immediate um, household health in terms of wh what you consume, when you consume, why you consume it. And it sounds like you've given a lot of thought into your farming practices, which encompass, you know, um, healthy living, healthy lifestyle, uh, preserving nature. So what's your take on modern farming and uh, where do you see Leafy's Farmery growing to? Um the drivers for any business must be sound. So, I mean, uh, we must realize modern farming techniques has its place. You can't do it anywhere. If you've got good soil, good water, good farming equipment and so forth, then you would rather than farm in the soil. Mm. So, for us, we had an opportunity on an area that not, was not farmed by soil or by equipment, and there was certain infrastructure, and there was good water to do it. So you must look at the fundamentals of why you are doing it. Uh, modern farming techniques are more efficient, but not so much so. I mean, you can still, the lettuce we are planting are more densely planted than they do in the fields or an open farming system, but not that much. So you must still look at the drivers when doing it. So if you have a small space or a piece of a farm that's not used um, or can't be used for soil farming, this may be an ideal place to do it, or you want to diversify a planting, something specific, specifically that will work in water, because remember, we're planting in water. Yeah. So you need to look at the drivers uh, while you are doing it. This is ideal also to do in, in the city environment, urban, um, to urban farming, and we have a very early stages of a case study looking into that, expanding this into an urban environment, because you don't need to do it on a farm, and then you get the obviously the um, competitive edge of being close to the market or closer to the market. Um, so yeah, that's, we are doing it because we've got the opportunity on a piece of farm that's not used for, for fields. And that's why we, we are doing it here, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, thank you so much for our conversation, uh, uh, Pierre. I thoroughly enjoyed learning about your business. And yeah, I think modern day farming is the place, the way to go. You know, I heard technology, efficiencies, and I mean, systems as well. And that's essentially the purpose of just running a business, not only just generating capital, but having certain uh, um, systems and processes in place, especially to grow your business and make it more sustainable. But thank you so much for your time this evening. And uh, I hope we could have you once again on a different topic around aquaponics or aquaponic farming, uh, maybe deep dive into it in more depth. But yeah, thank you so much for your insights and your time. My pleasure. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. If you just missed this episode, we're talking to Pierre Cronier, who is uh, from Leafy's Farmery. And he told us about his operation in terms of aquaponics um, and also adding a bit of um, leafy crops into it and also diversifying into fermentation. Who knew that tea could eventually become vinegar in this very specific yet sounding almost technical and complicated process of his fermentation processes. But I hope you enjoyed uh, this conversation this evening and learned quite a lot about um, aquaponics farming or just got a brief snippet into it. And if you're looking to venture into the space, I definitely would encourage you to do a lot of research and speak to aquaponic farmers because based from our conversation today with Pierre, it sounds quite technical. You have to be hands-on it sounds quite intensive and um, even though from a scale perspective only a 10 by 30 greenhouse infrastructure there's still a lot of work that needs to be taken into place and also find markets tilapia 
your, uh, your, your leafy crops. It's always about being able to sell that crop at the end of the day, sell your product at the end of the day, so you can reinvest those capitals into your business. I thoroughly enjoyed my conversation with Pierre and hope you did too. And thank you so much for watching. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you next week at 8 p.m. on Tuesday. See you then. Take care. Thank you.